Good morning students, I am Dr. B. Mano Vijay, Associate Professor from the Department of Periodontology, Vinayamshan Sankracharya Dental College. Today, we will be discussing about case history, diagnosis and treatment plan in periodontics. So, these are the contents of today's presentation. First, we will be starting with the introduction, then how to take a periodontology case sheet, patient's demographic details and history, extra oral examination, intra oral examination, indices, gingival and periodontal status, investigations, diagnosis, prognosis, treatment plan and maintenance recall in case sheet recording in periodontology. A case history is the blueprint of the treatment plan. It helps in establishing early diagnosis and enables prompt treatment plan. It is the planned professional conversation with the patient that enable the patients to communicate their symptoms Periodontal diagnosis is determined after careful analysis of the case history and evaluation of the clinical signs and symptoms as well as the results of various tests which includes clinical, radiographical, biochemical, microbiological and hematological tests. So what are the basic requirements of recording a case sheet? First, you introduce yourself to the patient. Listen to your patients. Really listen. Allow the patients to express themselves. You as a clinician should be trustworthy. Ask everything but write only the pathology that is needed for the diagnosis. The following discussion will provide a recommended sequence of procedures for the proper diagnosis and treatment plan of periodontal diseases. So here comes the patient demographic details and history. Name. Always write the name of the patient with initials and surname. It is used for identification of the patient, for record and recall purpose, for communication and psychological beneficial effect. Age. There are certain age related diseases which are essential for treatment planning. For example, chronic periodontitis is more prevalent in people of age group 35 and above. In aggressive periodontitis is commonly seen in the people of age group 22 to 35 years of age. Prepubertal periodontitis, localized aggressive periodontitis, necrotizing ulcerative periodontitis, all are related with age. Prognosis in younger patients is poor compared to older patients. So, it also helps in to determining the dosage of drug to be prescribed for the patients. Next comes the gender. Localized aggressive periodontitis, puberty gingivitis, osteoporosis, menopausal periodontitis are more common in females than males. Chronic periodontitis is more common in males with smoking habit. Address, it is used for communication with the patient to rule out endemic disease, for example, fluorosis. Occupation, we have got certain work related hazards. Acid fume workers have more gingival erosion, tailors, carpenters have incisor tooth notch. The stress related works always leads to bruxism and it also helps us to know the socio-economic status of the patient. Coming to the outpatient number or OP number, it helps us to easy retrieval of case details for hospital statistics to maintain and record census. Marital status, it is to know if it is a consanguineous marriage between the families. Chief complaint, it should be recorded in patient's own words and should be simple. It can be a symptom or group of symptoms. The common complaints include deposits in teeth, bleeding gums, pain, bad breath, foot impaction that is the foot stuck in between the teeth, spacing between the teeth, sensitivity of teeth, receding gums, swelling of gums, loosening of teeth, dryness of mouth, itching of gums, aesthetic requirements. And how we should write the history of the presenting illness of the chief complaint? It is the elaboration of the chief complaint. It starts from the first symptom to the date of examination. It should include onset, duration, location, nature of pain or deposit, severity, aggravating factors, relieving factors, associated symptoms if any should be recorded in the history. Medical history. It enables the monitoring of the medical conditions and the evaluation of underlying systemic conditions. It provides a basis for determining whether the dental treatment might affect the systemic health of the patient. 
provides an initial starting point for assessing the possible influence of the patient's systemic health on the patient's oral health and or dental treatment. The importance of it is to be explained to the patient because patients often omit information they cannot relate to their dental problem. It should always include the recent or post hospitalizations or operations to rule out any infections, aesthetic and hemorrhagic complications, any medication being taken at the present time, that is you should stress on the anticoagulants and steroids, abnormal bleeding tendencies, history of allergies, information regarding the onset of puberty in female, menopause, menstrual disorders and pregnancies. Dental history. Any past dental history should be recorded. It should include the duration and nature of the treatment. If the patient has extracted, then the reason and associated complication should be noted. In orthodontic treatment, the duration and termination of the treatment should be recorded. If there is pain in the teeth or gums, it should be noted. And also the history of previous periodontal problems. The type of treatment, whether it is surgical or non-surgical, all should be documented and recorded. Family history. It helps us to know if there is any hereditary linked problems inside the family. Normally it includes diabetes, hemophilia and hypertension. Personal history includes diet, smoking or tobacco use, drug use, brushing habits, parafunctional habits and other habits. In diet, ask whether the patient is a mixed or vegetarian diet. Vegetarian diets are mostly fibrous in nature. They stimulate saliva and have self-cleansing action. The more amount of sticky food we take, there is increased retention of plaque. Coming to the smoking and tobacco use, it may cause excessive scarring of mucosal surfaces and occasionally malportioning of the teeth involved. You should add the duration of smoking, number of cigarettes smoked per day. The WHO classification of smokers should be well known that is the pack per year and classification of smokers. When you know the patient is a smoker, you should take up the comprehensive intervention program. That is the five years. Ask the patient how long is a smoker, advise him to quit smoking, assess the nature of the problem, assess him and arrange him to for further help in arresting the smoking habit. Bruxism can lead to tooth wear and it can have muscle hypertrophy, masticatory myalgia, headaches, and occasionally fracture of the teeth. Coming to lip and cheek biting, they may cause excessive scarring of mucosal surfaces and occasionally malportioning of the teeth involved. Localized malportioning may in turn result in functional occlusal interferences and associated occlusal traumatization and also keratinization. Tongue thrusting, persistent forceful wedging of the tongue particularly in the anterior region. You can see in the picture I have put here, it causes excessive lateral pressure that may be traumatic to the periodontium, spreading and tilting of the anterior teeth with anterior and posterior open bites. You can appreciate in the picture shown here. There will be tooth mobility, accumulation of food debris at the gingival margin. How to determine tongue thrusting? Hold the lip apart and ask the patient to swallow. There will be infantile swallow. So that is the test to know whether the patient has got tongue thrusting habit or not. Next we have got mouth breathing. The gingival changes include erythema, edema, enlargement, diffuse surface to the exposed areas. You can see the erythema, edema, enlargement and diffuse surface to the exposed areas here. And how to diagnose mouth breathing? It is by butterfly test water in the mouth test or double mirror test. So these are the clinical tests. In the mirror test, we use a clear mirror that should be kept near the mouth. The mirror gets fog as shown in the picture. Next in the butterfly test, cotton fibers in the shape of the butterfly are kept near the nose and the mouth. If he is a nasal breather, fibers near the nose moves, whereas for mouth breathers, Fibers near the mouth will move. So these are the butterfly shaped cotton fibers placed. Then in the water holding test, the patient is asked to fill his mouth with water and to retain it for period of time. A nasal breather do this with ease while 
mouth breather finds it difficult. In the extra oral general examination, we should assess jaw symmetry. Any asymmetry is to be detected in the, as in the case of facial swelling. Lips, note the lip color, texture, any surface abnormalities as well as angular or vertical fissures, lip pits, cold sores, ulcers, scabs, nodules, keratotic plaques and scars. Note the lip seal and also the competency of the lips, whether they are competent or incompetent. For TMJ, note any deviation, clicking sounds while opening and closing indicative of a TMJ disorder. For the lymph node examination, inflamed nodes are tender, palpable and fairly mobile. Normally, in, in periodontitis patients, it is seen in anag and acute periodontal abscess. Coming to the intraoral general examination, first we will check labial and buccal mucosa. Palpate upper and lower lips for any thickening or swelling. Note orifices of minor salivary glands and the presence of four days granules. In the tongue, inspect the dorsum for swelling and ulcers, coating of the tongue and the variations in color and texture. Coming to the heart tissue examination, you should always note the teeth mixing. Long span, edentulous areas have a tendency towards mesial migration, distal to the space. Can you see here? In such cases, the distal cusp of the migrated tooth acts as a plunger cusp, thereby forcefully wedging the foot between the extruded opposite tooth, thereby leading to foot impaction, gingival inflammation and bone loss. The stains or discolorations include pigmented deposits on the tooth surface. They are of primarily of aesthetic concerns. It can be detected visually and can be easily removed. Calculus. We have got supragingeal calculus as well as subgingeal calculus. It is visible in the oral cavity, white or whitish in color. The supragingeal calculus is hard clay-like consistency, commonly seen in the lingual surface of the mandibular anteriors and buccal surfaces of maxillary molars. And the subgingeal calculus are hard and dense. They are dark brown or greenish black in color. They are firmly attached to the tooth surface. They are detected by tactile perception with an explorer. Note we use an explorer to check for the calculus. It can be number 17 or 3A or warmer may be used to detect, deflect the gingiva and aid in visualization of the calculus. Coming to the wasting diseases of the teeth. Wasting is defined as any gradual loss of tooth substance characterized by the formation of smooth polished surfaces without regard to the possible mechanism of the loss. The forms of wasting diseases are attrition, abrasion and erosion. Attrition. It is the occlusal wear resulting from functional contacts with the opposing teeth. It increases with increase in age. You can appreciate attrition in the incisor edges. Abrasion is the loss of tooth substance induced by mechanical wear other than mastication. Causes include tooth brushing with an abrasive dentrifice, action of clasped or abutment teeth. It always results in saucer shaped or wedge shaped indentations with smooth shiny surface you can appreciate here and continuous exposure to the abrasive agent combined with decalcification of the enamel by locally forming acids may result in loss of enamel followed by loss of dentin. Erosion. It is a cuneiform defect with sharply defined wedge shaped depression in the cervical area of the facial tooth surface. You can appreciate the erosion here. The long axis of the eroded area is perpendicular to the vertical axis of the tooth. The surfaces are smooth, hard and polished. The causes include decalcification by acid beverages or citrus fruits along with the combined effect of acid salivary secretion and friction. We have got a specialist index called Oral Hygiene Index Simplified. It was developed by John C. Green and Jack R. Vermilon in 1964. Only fully erupted permanent teeth are scored here. Natural teeth with full crown restoration 
and surfaces reduced in height by caries or trauma or not scored. An alternate tooth is then examined. Explorers are used to access the debris and calculus. So, these are the tooth that are being scored in oral hygiene index simplified. We have got teeth number 16 that is the buccal surface. If it is absent, we can go for an option as 17 or 18. For 11, it is 21. For 26, it is 27 or 28. For 36, it is 37 or 38. For 31, it is 41. For 46, it is 47 and 48. So, here we can see the buccal and labial surfaces are being scored in 11, 16 and 26 and lingual surfaces for 46 and 36 and labial surface for 31. Debris index for score 0, there is no debris or stain present. Here you can see there is no debris or stains present. For 1, soft tissue debris covering not more than one third of the tooth surface or presence of extrinsic stains Please note it, extensive shell strain should be noted in score 1 without other debris regardless of the areas covered. Score 2, we have got soft tissue debris covering more than one third but not more than two third of the exposed surface. And score 3, soft debris covering more than two third of the exposed tooth surface. And coming to the calculus index, score 0, there is no calculus present. In score 1, supragingival calculus covering not more than one third of the exposed tooth surface and score 2, supragingival calculus covering more than one third but not more than two third the exposed tooth surface or presence of individual flex of subgingival calculus around the cervical portion of the tooth or both. Coming to score 3, it is supragingival calculus covering more than two-third of the exposed tooth surface or a continuous heavy band of subgingival calculus around the cervical portion of tooth or both. Coming to the calculation and interpretation for debris score, it is calculated by the total score by the number of surfaces examined. For calculus index score, it is a total surface score by the number of surfaces examined and Finally, we have the oral hygiene score which is the combination of debris index score and calculus index score. So, the debris index score and calculus index score always ranges from 0 to 3 and oral hygiene score ranges from 0 to 6 and not more than that. Interpretation, if the score is 0 to 0 0.6, we have got good score and fair oral hygiene by 0 0.7 to 1.8 poor it is 1.9 to 3.0. For oral hygiene index score, the good range is from 0.0 to 1.2, fair is from 1.3 to 3.0, poor it is 3 to 6. The uses of oral hygiene index simplified has, the, it is widely used in epidemiological studies of periodontal diseases, useful in evaluation of dental health education programs, evaluating the efficacy of toothbrushes and to evaluate an individual's level of oral cleanliness. Proximal contacts. These are nothing but slightly open contacts which permits food impaction. The tightness of contacts should be checked by means of clinical observation and with dental floss. You can use the dental floss to check the proximal contacts. Abnormal contact relationships may also initiate occlusal changes such as shift in the median line between the central incisors labial version of the maxillary canine, buccal or lingual displacement of the posterior teeth and uneven relationship of the marginal ridges. So, this is the normal gingiva. We have got the marginal gingiva or unattached gingiva. Then comes the attached gingiva. Here is the mucogingival junction and over that we have got the alveolar mucosa. In between the two teeth we have got the intergenital gingiva or papilla and the narrow crevice or space is the sulcus that is inside. So, what are the clinical features of gingiva in health and in disease? Normally, in health, the color of the gingiva is pink in color or it may have some amount of melanin pigmentation. The factors that are responsible for the color of the gingiva are vascular supply, thickness and degree of keratinization of epithelium, presence of pigment containing cells like melanin. 
in disease the color changes may be marginal or diffuse or it can be pale red in color in case of mild inflammation magenta or pink with bluish hue in chronic inflammation you can see the pink with bluish hue in case of chronic inflammation and red in case of mild or acute inflammation the contour of the gingiva is nothing but it is the scalloping and knife edge part of the marginal gingiva in interdental papilla in the anterior surface it is pyramidal in shape or in posterior it is tent shape the shape of the tooth and its alignment in the arch determines the contour of the gingiva the location of the size of the proximal contact the dimension and of the facial and lingual gingival embrasures also determine the contour of the gingiva the marginal gingiva becomes rolled or rounded interdental papilla becomes blunt and flat in case of inflammation you can see the rounded marginal gingiva and blunt interdental papilla punched out and crater like depression of the crest of the interdental papilla is seen in case of anak exaggerated scalloping or apostrophe shaped indentations extending from and into the gingival margins for varying distance on the facial surface is called the stillman's cleft you can appreciate stillman's cleft here life saver like enlargement of marginal gingiva is the meckel's festoons the size of the gingiva corresponds to the sum of cellular and intercellular and vascular supply vascular component is increased in case of inflammation cellular components are increased in case of hyperplasia enlargement may be inflammatory or fibrotic the consistency normal gingiva is firm and resilient except for free margin tightly bound to the underlying bone in chronic gingivitis there will be soggy puffiness that pits on pressure in acute gingivitis the puffiness and softness can be appreciated you have to write it as soft and edematous in consistency for fibrosis you can see the fibrosis and long standing inflammation the gingiva can be represented as firm and leathery in consistency always mention the region of the tooth where you are seeing the consistency whenever you record a case it is very very important you have to mention whether it is specific to a particular area or it is generalized surface texture stippling is a form of adaptive specialization or reinforcement for function it is seen in the attached gingiva and central portion of the interdental gingiva can you see here this is stippling stippling is absent in infants and in old age and on the lingual surfaces stippling is lost in gingival infections you can see the absence of stippling in infection stippling increases on stimulation of the gingiva viewed by drying the gingiva we can see an orange peel like appearance you can see the orange peel like appearance if it is seen then you say stippling is present and it denotes healthy gingiva position of the gingiva it refers to the level at which the gingival margin is attached to the tooth the level at which the gingival margin is attached to the tooth it is at the level of the cemento enamel junction or above in case of recession it is present in a apical position in case of inflammation it is present in coronal position you can see here it is coronal to cj bleeding on probing it is a widely used criterion to diagnose gingival inflammation a periodontal probe is inserted to the bottom of the gingival sulcus or periodontal pocket with light force and gently moved laterally along the pocket wall bleeding can appear immediately or may be delayed and so you can wait for 30 to 60 seconds after probing if bleeding is present record as positive and if it is absent then gingiva is healthy exudate palpation of the marginal gingiva with a probe or digitally may squeeze a white yellowish exudate from the gingival crevice in disease states so you can write exudate is present so these are the mucogingival problems normally we write 
that is the inadequate width of attached gingiva, shallow vestibule and frenum interfering with marginal gingiva. Width of attached gingiva. An adequate width of attached gingiva prevents plaque formation and soft tissue recession. It is measured by clinical measurements, tension test, roll test and skillers potassium iodide solution test. These are the normal values for attached gingiva in various regions of the gingiva. In maxillary incisors, it is 3.62 mm, in premolars it is 2.06 mm and in molars it is 2.02 mm. In mandibular teeth, in incisors it is 3.31 mm, in premolars it is 2.02 mm and molars it is 1.83 mm. Any measurement less than 1 mm is recorded to be inadequate width of attached gingiva. Here I have just explained only the clinical measurement that is how to measure a width of attached gingiva clinically. So this is the formula to calculate the width of attached gingiva. First you measure the total width from the gingiva to the mucogingival margin that is from the gingival margin to the mucogingival margin you take a measurement. Then measure the probing pocket depth that is from the gingival margin to the base of the pocket. Calculate the width of the attached gingiva by subtracting the probing pocket depth from the total width of the gingiva. Then you will know the width of attached gingiva. Frenal pull. To check the abnormal frenum attachment, a blanch test can be performed along with an examination of the clinical appearance of attachment. The blanch test is performed by lifting the lip and pulling it outwards. The appearance of blanching indicates a high labial frenum attachment. So here we can see in the lower anteriors and here you can see the blanching test, you can see the blanching here. There are four types of frenal attachment, that is a mucosal, where the frenum is attached to the mucogingival junction, gingival in the attached gingiva, papillary in the interdental papilla and papillary penetrating type. So these are the four types of classification of frenum. Probing pocket depth. It is the pathological deepening of the gingival sulcus. It is measured from the gingival sulcus or periodontal pocket and is measured using Williams periodontal probe. The six surfaces in each tooth are examined and the deepest measurement is considered as the PPD of that tooth. The six surfaces that are examined are distofacial or buccal, midfacial or buccal, mesiofacial or buccal, distopalatal mid palatal and mesio palatal surfaces. The how should you probe? The probe should be inserted parallel to the vertical axis of the tooth and walked around circumferentially around each surface of the tooth to detect the areas of deepest penetration. Walking the probe to explore the entire probe. So this terminology is very very important walking the probe. We have a small difference between probing pocket depth and clinical attachment level. Probing pocket depth is measured from gingival margin to the base of the periodontal pocket. From gingival margin that is the free marginal gingiva to the base of the pocket. Clinical attachment level on the other hand is measured from the cementoenamel junction to the base of the periodontal pocket. So measuring the CAL in recession is that First, you have to measure from the CJ to the marginal gingiva and then from the marginal gingiva to the base of the pocket. So these two machines should be measured and added so that you will get the clinical attachment level in case of recession. So this is another picture that shows how you measure. For example, if the gingival margin to the base of the de pocket depth is 4 mm and from CJ to base of the pocket is 1 mm then the CAL of recession is 5 mm, 1 plus 4 gives you 5. Pathological tooth migration. It refers to the tooth displacement that results when the balance between the factors that maintain physiologic tooth position is disturbed by periodontal disease. The causes of pathological tooth migrations include trauma from occlusion, pressure from the tongue, pressure from the granulation tissue of periodontal pockets. Here you can see the displacement of the tooth that is caused with the imbalance between the physiological tooth position and periodontal disease. Mobility. Mobility is graded clinically by pre applying pressure with ends of two metallic instruments or one metallic instrument and a finger. 
we should try to rock the tooth gently in buccolingual direction toward the tongue and outwards again. Then the mobility is graded as grade 1 that is slightly more than normal, grade 2 moderately more than normal, grade 3 severe mobility facio-lingually and or mesiodistally combined with vertical displacement of the tooth. So what are the causes of tooth mobility? Loss of tooth support, trauma from occlusion, endoperiolations, then pregnancy. When occlusal forces exceed the adaptive capacity of the tissues, tissue injury occurs. The resultant injury is termed as trauma from occlusion and the following tests are used to check trauma from occlusion. Fremitus test and articulating paper test. The Fremitus test is used to check the functional mobility. It is the test used to detect the trauma from occlusion. It is a measurement of the vibratory pattern of the teeth when the teeth are placed in contacting position and movements. To measure Fremitus, a dampened index finger is placed along the buccal and labial surface of the maxillary teeth. The patient is asked to tap the teeth together in the maximum intercuspal position and then grind systematically in the lateral protrusive and lateral protrusive contacting movements and positions. The teeth that are displaced by the patient in these jaw positions are then identified. We have got three grades of fermitus test. In degree 1 or grade 1 fermitus, there is only slight vibration can be felt. In grade 2 fermitus, the tooth is clearly palpable but movement is barely visible. In grade 3 fermitus, movement of clearly observed visually. The other factors that indicate the trauma from occlusion include radiographically, there is a widened periodontal ligament space, vertical or angular bone loss, infra bone epochs, and pathological migrations. Gingival recession. Epical migration of the gingiva and exposure of the root is termed as gingival recession. So, we have got various classification of gingival recession. I have taken Miller's grade classification of marginal tissue recession in that class 1 is marginal tissue recession that does not extend to the mucogingival junction and there is no interdental or interpapillary loss. Class 2 marginal tissue recession that extends to or beyond the mucogingival junction with no periodontal attachment loss bone or soft tissue interdentally. In class 3 marginal tissue recession that extends to or beyond the mucogingival junction with periodontal attachment loss in the interdental area or mole positioning of the teeth. The mole positioning of the teeth should be written in class 3 gingival recession. In class 4 gingival recession, the marginal tissue recession will extend to or beyond the mucogingival junction with severe or bone or soft tissue loss in the interdental area and severe mole positioning of the teeth. Always note, lingual recession is not been taken into account in Miller's classification of gingival recession. And another classification is by Sullivan Atkins, where he had classified recession into shallow, wide, shallow, deep, deep, narrow and deep, wide. Furcation involvement. Furcation is an area of complex anatomical morphology that may be difficult or impossible to debride by routine periodontal instrumentation. Neighbors probing with the marking of 3, 6, 9, 12 and explorer number 23 are used to detect furcation involvement. Here is the Glickman's classification of furcation involvement. Grade 1, it is incipient or early stage, supra bony pockets and primarily it affects the soft tissue with no radiographic changes. Grade 2, it can affect one or two furcations of same teeth. Lesion is essentially culdi sac with a definite horizontal component. In grade 3, the bone is not attached to the dome of the furcation. Clinically, it may not even be able to pass pedonal probe through and through because of interference with bifurcation ridges or bony margins. Furcation is filled with soft tissues. Radiographically displaces as a radiolucent area in the notch of the tooth. Grade 4, interdental bone is destroyed and has pedontal recession. You can see recession here. Furcation opening is clinically seen. A through and through tunnel exists. We have got a very important index for assessment of the pedontal status that is the Russell's pedontal index. It was developed by Russell AI in 1956. 
The pedonal index is reported to be useful among large population, but it is of limited use for individuals or small groups. All the teeth are examined in this index. Russell chose the scoring values as 0, 1, 2, 6, 8 in order to relate the stage of the disease in an epidemiological survey to the clinical condition observed. The Russell's rule states that when in doubt, assign the lowest score. So always keep it in mind, when you have a doubt, assign the lower score. So according to Russell, score 0 is negative. There is neither overt inflammation in the investing tissues nor loss of function due to destruction of supporting bone. Radiographically, the appearance is essentially normal. In mild gingivitis and overt in area of inflammation in the free gingiva, it does not circumscribe the tooth. In gingivitis, inflammation completely circumscribes the tooth, but there is no apparent break in the epithelial attachment. We normally we do not score 4 in the case history recording unless you have a radiograph. There is an early notch like resorption of alveolar crest in the radiograph used only when radiographs are available. This point is very, very important. So normally the scorings you write in Russell's periodontal indexes, if it is really healthy, clinically very, very healthy, then you assign the score of 0. For gingivitis, if it is not circumscribing the tooth, you assign the score of 1. If it is circumscribing the entire gingiva, you give the score of 2. Then comes the score of 6. We do not have 3, 5 and 7. In score 6, gingivitis with pocket formation, the epithelial attachment is broken and there is a pocket. So now the transition from gingivitis to periodontitis has occurred. There is no interference with normal masticatory function. The tooth is firm and the has not drifted. There is horizontal bone loss involving the entire alveolar crest up to half of the length of the two root in the radiographic finding. Then we have the score 8. There is advanced destruction with loss of masticatory function. The tooth may be loose, may have drifted, may sound dull on percussion with metallic instrument or may be depressible in the socket. There is advanced bone loss involving more than half of the tooth root or a definite intra-bony pocket. With widening of pedontal ligament, there may be root resorption or rarification at the apex. So this is how we calculate the pedonal index score per person. It is sum of individual scores by number of teeth present. This is the clinical condition and the individual scores accordingly. For clinically normal supportive tissue, the score is between 0 0.0 to 0 0.2. In simple gingivitis, the score is 0.3 to 0.9. For beginning of beginning of destructive pedonal disease, it is 1 to 1.9. Established destructive pedonal disease, it is 2 to 4.9. And in terminal disease, it is 5 to 8. So these are the laboratory aids that help to clinical diagnosis. Laboratory tests aid in the diagnosis of systemic diseases that contribute to pedonal diseases and also in treatment decision when dealing with medically compromised patients. Example, fasting blood sugar level, HbA1c diabetes, etc. Analysis of blood smears, blood cell counts, white blood cell, differential counts and erythrocyte sedimentation rates are used to evaluate the presence of blood dyscreases and generalized infections. Determination of coagulation time, bleeding time, clot retraction time, prothrombin time and capillary fragility as well as bone marrow studies may be required at times. Radiographs in a periodontal examination, the, we should need at least 14 intraoral films and 4 posterior bite wing films. Panoramic radiographs are a simple and convenient method of obtaining a survey view of the dental arch and the surrounding structures and are helpful for the detection of developmental abnormalities pathological lesions of the teeth and jaws and fractures as well as dental screening examinations of large groups. They provide an informative overall radiographic picture of the distribution and severity of bone destruction with pedonal disease. But a complete intraoral series is required for pedonal diagnosis and treatment planning. So what are the common pedonal diseases we have? We have gingivitis, periodontitis, under periodontitis we have got chronic periodontitis which is again categorized into generalized and localized. If there is more than 30% of the total sites are involved, then we call it as generalized chronic periodontitis. If it is less than 30% of sites are involved, then we call it as localized chronic periodontitis. In aggressive periodontitis too, we have got generalized and localized. Then 
pedontitis as a manifestation of systemic diseases, abscess of the pedontium, necrotizing ulcerative pedontitis, endoperiolesions and developmental or inherited conditions. How will you describe gingivitis? It can be localized or generalized. It can be papillary gingivitis or diffuse gingivitis when it involves all the three layers of the gingiva it is diffused. Okay. So, accordingly you have to write the diagnosis whether it is a localized marginal gingivitis or generalized marginal gingivitis, localized papillary gingivitis or generalized papillary gingivitis. This is how you should write in a diagnosis. So, what is the difference between gingivitis and pedontitis? In gingivitis, it is confined only to the gingiva. The symptoms include red or swollen gums, gums will bleed when you brush your teeth or floss and it may lead to pedontitis if left untreated. The advanced stage of gingivitis is the pedontitis. So, along with those symptoms, we will have loosened teeth, exposure of the root, tooth's root and can also lead to tooth loss if it is not treated. For pedontitis, always keep these points in mind. The probing pocket depth may be greater than 5 mm. You can appreciate gingival recession, furcation involvement may be seen, bone loss, mobility of teeth, pathological migration of tooth and then tooth loss. So, these things you should always keep it in mind. Always consider the probing pocket depth, clinical attachment level, then um, radiographic assessment, mobile tooth, all these are some of the things that lead to pedontitis. Prognosis. After diagnosis, you should know how we should have the prognosis. The prediction of the duration, course and termination of the disease and its response to the treatment. It is divided into overall prognosis and individual prognosis. Further classified as excellent, good, fair, poor, questionable and hopeless. So, this is a table given McGurry and Nunn. So, they have given how we should categorize each category of prognosis. That is, if it is good, then you are able to control the etiological factors, enough clinical and radiographical pedontal support to enable the tooth to be maintained by the patient and clinician with proper maintenance. Fair, approximately 25% of attachment loss as measured clinically and radiographically there will be class and furcation involvement. The severity of the furcation involvement would allow adequate maintenance. For poor prognosis, there will be 50 percent of attachment loss and class 2 furcation. The location and the degree of the furcation would accommodate proper maintenance although with difficulty. In questionable prognosis, there will be greater than 50 percent of attachment loss, poor crown root ratio, class 2 not easily assessed or class 3 furcation involvement class 2 mobility or more significant root proximity will be there. Four plus prognosis there will be severe attachment loss and extraction is performed or suggested. Treatment plan it is the scheduled sequence of therapeutic measures used to cure or arrest the disease process. In the preliminary phase you should treat the emergencies. In perio normally we will treat acute pedonal abscesses. In phase 1 or the etiotrophic phase we will educate and motivate the patient. Oral prophylaxis like scaling and root planning will be done. Professional splinting of mobile teeth and occlusal adjustment will be carried out. Non-surgical pedontal treatment which includes local drug delivery, minor orthodontic tooth movement and temporary restrictions. In phase 2 of surgical phase, we will go for pedontal surgery and root canal therapy. In the restorative phase or phase 3, final restoration, prosthetic therapy and fixed orthodontic therapy will be carried out. In phase 4, we have got the maintenance phase where we will have the periodical recall of the patient. It is based on the supportive pedontal therapy given by Merin's classification. So, first we will have the emergency phase followed by the non-surgical phase, then again maintenance phase it based on the surgical or restorative treatment the phases will differ. So, this is the supportive pedonal treatment given by Merin where they have classified patients into first year. They were again classified into class A, class B and class C patients and how they will be recalled. For the first year patient, there will be routine therapy and an uneventful healing. Difficult cases with complicated process, furcation involvement, poor crown to ratios or questionable patient cooperation, they will be recalled in 1 to 2 months, whereas in the routine therapy and uneventful healing only in 3 months. In class A patients, the patient will be recalled in 6 months to 1 year. In class B patients, in 3 to 4 months, decide on recall interval based on number and severity of negative factors. In class C, we will be recalling the patients, let us 3 to 4 months, decide on recall interval based on number and severity of negative factors, consider retreating some areas or extracting severely involved teeth. In class A patients, 
the, the excellent results will be well maintained for one year or more. In class B, generally good results maintained reasonably well for one year or more, but patient displays some of the following features. That is, they may have heavy calculus formation, systemic disease will be there, occlusal problems, complicated processes. In class C, generally poor results after pedonal therapy and or severe negative factors from the following list, many remaining pockets, occlusal problems, complicated processes, recurrent dental caries and so on. So to conclude, pedontal examination and diagnosis begin with obtaining a thorough health and dental history. Once a detailed patient history has been obtained and a thorough clinical examination has been completed, the information collected is analyzed and synthesized to arrive at a diagnosis. The pedontal examination is the basis from which the diagnosis, prognosis and treatment plan is ultimately rendered. Therefore, a thorough and accurate pedonal examination is of the utmost importance. So these are my references. Hope this session was very useful to you. Thank you for listening and watching my presentation. <music>